Today's the recitation. What are your questions on the recitation? Anybody have any questions? If not, I have some things prepared, obviously. Okay. Um, but, um, and I actually have some handouts prepared. But uh, we were talking, last time I had gotten a question about tenure, and I told some stories about, about MIT and tenure. Um, and we talked a little bit about Epstein, and I don't know anything of, directly about Epstein, but I do know something, a lot about MIT and the ethics of people who do things around here, okay? So I decided I would tell a story about molten metal technologies, okay? Uh, and so I call it Money Talks at MIT, and I said that before, okay, that money talks. But it's always good to start out, light, lighten up the audience with a little humor. So uh, news item, Harvard Medical School announces it will use attorneys instead of rats in laboratory tests. Justifications, attorneys are more plentiful than rats. The lab attendants do not grow attached to the, to the attorneys. And the last one is, there's some things a rat won't do, okay? So it's always good in a talk to lighten up the audience a little bit. Um, but I say there's a similarity between um, attorneys and university administrators. Not that they're as plentiful as attorneys necessarily, but in terms of their ethics, they're about the same. Um, and there's some very 80, I work with attorneys all the time. 80% of the attorneys are really good people okay, with high ethical values, and 20% are just pure slime, okay? And the reason for attorney jokes is because of those slimy ones out there, so far as that goes. And they are pretty slimy, but the problem with the whole profession, in my opinion, is to them, advocacy is the number one thing. If you look at a hierarchy of important things, being an advocate, okay, you go take... Um, O.J. Simpson to, to, to you, get, you defend O.J. Simpson on his murder charge, had nothing, they turned it into something that had nothing to do with O.J. Simpson, whether he committed murder or not. It had to do was with the, uh, were the uh, Los Angeles police racist? Yes, of course they were, okay? They had all kinds of evidence that the police department in L.A. was racist, okay? And the jury can acquitted O.J. Simpson because the police department was racist, if you really get down to it. And that's a success for those attorneys, to get a murderer out of jail, keep them out of jail, because they're advocates, and they won. Well, is it really a win for society to keep murderers out of jail from being convict convicted? If, in an attorney's mind, it is, because advocacy is more important than justice. I guarantee you that they think that advocacy is more important than justice, okay? In fact, one of my favorite quotes comes from a movie called The Civil Action where John Travolta, uh, Robert Duvall is the, attorney, the defense attorney. This is about a chemical spill up in uh, Woburn, Massachusetts. It's a true story. And uh, so Robert Duvall is representing the defense attorney and he's just offered John Travolta $20 million to settle the case. And Travolta's turned him down. And uh, Duvall says, what are you looking for? And uh, uh, Travolta says, I'm looking for the truth. And Duvall's comment was a wonderful comment. Absolutely true. You quit looking for the truth the day you filed suit. Okay? The courtroom is not about truth. It's who can, whose attorneys can put together the best story. And pull the wool over juries' eyes, okay? Anyway, um, and I think we could talk about that in the whole impeachment proceedings that we've been watching. Okay, um, so that's the news item. Let's talk about molten metals technologies. Uh, in 1989, this is a true story, uh, and I was actually involved in it, Nonetheless, it took me about five hours to collect all this stuff with the references, and this will be on the website uh, so far as that goes. 1989, Chris Nagel, a doctoral student in chemical engineering at MIT and a former employee of U.S. Steel, founded a company to use molten steel as a method of converting toxic waste into useful products. Okay? 
Um, reportedly, Nagel conceived the idea while employed at U.S. Steel. He notified U.S. Steel of his IP, and U.S. Steel said, nah, they looked at it and said, we're not interested. And they let him have it, okay? Um, and, that, and to tie this into Steve um, Alliance lectures, those types of things happen from time to time. Does anybody know the Doc Edgerton story? Who's Doc Edgerton, first of all? You don't even know who Doc Edgerton is, okay? You go on the fourth floor of building eight here, uh, building four here, and there's the Edgerton Center. When I was a student, Doc Edgerton was this semi-billionaire electrical engineering professor that all the students loved. Doc had uh, come to MIT in like 1928 or so from Nebraska, and he was on the faculty in electrical engineering, and he had a contract from General Electric to study motors. And he wanted to understand the dynamics of motors while they were actually operating and spinning. So he conceived of the stroboscope. He invented the stroboscope. Okay? So he would flash the light at, at a known frequency. And if he could tie that to just off the frequency of the motor, you could see, you could just watch it and you'd have a slow motion movie of a motor running in your, with your own eyes, not a movie, but you could see it. So he told General Electric about his idea because. You know, they, had the, they, they were funding the research and had the intellectual property, and they said, what would we use that for? So they let him keep the intellectual property. He patented it and became a half a billionaire, okay? Uh, one of the ways he made, he formed a company called EG&G, Edgerton, Grimhausen, and Greer, which is still a multi-billion dollar company here in Boston. Uh, he became a great friend of the Science Museum. Most of the Science Museum in Boston, a lot of it was funded by Doc Edgerton. Um, he was just a wonderful Midwestern guy. He hated MIT meetings. He hated serving on committees. And he, uh, I've heard that in the electrical engineering department, whenever he's asked to serve on a committee, he did a terrible job so they wouldn't ask him the next time. Right? That's one way to do it. Uh, but Doc was a wonderful person. If, I, I did my doctoral thesis and my bachelor's thesis 50 yards down the hall from Doc's office. And he was just a wonderful person. Uh, at, uh, he worked on the Manhattan Project. That, that's where he made some of, the company made some of the money, taking pictures. You see pictures of the first nuclear explosions? Those were probably Doc's pictures. He was a famous photographer. Uh, after World War II, oh, uh, he was at the second station closest to the first nuclear blast at Alamogordo in New Mexico, okay? I mean, he told me that, okay? Um, and after the war, he got interested in undersea technology and stuff, and he used to go on cruises with Jacques Cousteau, okay? And he was, he was all over National Geographic. He was in all kinds of public broadcasting movies and stuff. He, he founded, he, he invented side scan uh, sonar and he, to find, look for the monitor of the monitor Merrimack, you know, the Civil War ironclads and stuff. And he found that. He went off looking for the Loch Ness Monster. I can remember walking down the Infinite Corridor on, what are they called, uh, um, Stonehenge Day or whatever when the sun, rise, sun shines right down. And Doc was there with students measuring exactly where the, the sun inter intersected the, the uh, wall with, and checking their watches and stuff so they could know the exact orientation of the infinite corridor with regard to the universe. Okay, his doc was just, he was, yeah, I could tell you his doc stories for, for a long time. He was a wonderful guy, and he, he became wealthy because General Electric didn't see much use to the technology. Well, U.S. Steel didn't see much use to this guy's technology and turned it down. So Nagel comes back to go to graduate school in chemical engineering at MIT, and uh, he, he had patented the technology, and he tells John Presson, who is head of MIT's technology licensing office, that, hey, I've got this patent. Preston thought this was fantastic. And you'll see some of the quotes later. Um, and the two of them formed a company. And supposedly in the early, early 90s, after they formed the company and handed out stock, both of them were worth $30 million overnight. Okay? And we're going to see if that created any conflicts of interest for them. Um, now, this next bullet had a 
gave preference to molten metal technology uh, over other MIT patented inventions uh, in marketing the venture capitalists. I got that from Professor Sadaway, who had some MIT patented technology that he had developed. And Preston was marketing Nagel's technology rather than the MIT invented technology. A little conflict there, maybe, OK? Um, Preston introduced Nagel to William Haney, who was a 27-year-old graduate of Harvard who had already made millions of dollars. He started a company and made, he, was, he got $15 million when he was 27. This is in the early 90s, or late 80s, or whatever. And so between Haney and at Harvard and Preston and Nagel at MIT, it formed a very strong alliance. And they went around marketing what they had. We'll talk about how good the technology was in a little bit. Al Gore says, who was Vice President of the United States and the technology guru, a shining example of American ingenuity, hard work, and business know-how. Does anyone know about when Al Gore was the commencement speaker at MIT? So the Sloan students got together, and they, every student, and I was on the, I was on the stand, you know, at graduation, where the faculty sit, and we didn't know what was going on. But every student, as they marched in, Sloan students were handing them buzzword bingo, OK? And everyone had a, a buzzword bingo sheet that had a bunch of buzzwords like internet, um, uh, technology driven, or something like that. And what you were supposed to do it had the rules. Whenever Al Gore, in his commencement address, used the word internet, you could cross off that buzzword, uh, the bingo. Uh, square. And if you actually got bingo, you know, everything in a row or whatever, you were just supposed to raise your sheet in the air, okay? Well, none of, none of, the, none of the, the parents or families or the faculty knew about this because it was just the, the graduates who, as they were walking in, got these buzz, buzzword bingo sheets. And everyone was different. I mean, the students had you know, put them together. It wasn't as if everybody had a different sheet. It really was a competition. But the Secret Service knew about it, okay? And they told Al Gore. And so Al Gore's giving his talk, and he'd use some word. And there'd be a cheer <laughs> from all the people who had that on their sheet, right? And he'd say, oh, I must have used a good word. <laughs> and none of us knew what he was talking about, except the students, okay? It's a great prank. Okay, one of the best pranks at MIT, but you don't, most people don't tell you about that hack. Um, see, you learned something worthwhile here, right? Um, and then uh, they had this guy, Maurice Strong, who was Secretary General of the United Nations Earth Summit, and he said, this technology can literally revolutionize our ability to deal with toxic waste, okay? This was on a thing I sent around last week uh, on a a case study at Boston University Business School. And so they had this technology they called catalytic extraction processing. Sounds pretty sexy, huh? Well, I don't know. Um, any case, this is it. They were going to take solid liquids and sludges and stick them in the bottom of a molten steel bath because that's actually how U.S. Steel would process steel, okay? It's called the QBOP process. You actually have a gas jet blowing uh, gases into the molten steel bath. And that's what Chris Nagel knew, and that was their recycling system. Molten metal bath, turns out iron is a universal solvent at high temperatures for almost anything on the periodic table, okay? Just like water is a universal solvent at room temperature for most things, okay? Um, and out would come gases, which would be a product, especially inorganics, which would be things that could be turned into plastics or something, and metals. As if, and it didn't, it, it, they kind of, when they sold this, it was like all these things came out pure. Of course they didn't come out pure. There was a little extra processing that had to go in there to purify them, make them useful. And then people would use them, and this was gonna, gonna revolutionize the world. Well, would someone with a degree in chemical engineering Call this a catalytic process? What does catalyst mean? 
A catalyst is something that speeds up a chemical reaction and is not consumed by the reaction and therefore can be recovered and reused over and over. This is not a catalytic process, folks, but it's a nice sounding name, isn't it? Ooh, that's marketing, okay? Tell the lie, okay? In terms that other people can't understand. Would a metallurgist consider that the output products are pure? Okay. Well, why uh, do we talk about metallurgists here? Well, well, let's talk about the hype. I'll talk about uh, the metallurgists later. On a scale of 10, this is a 13, according to Preston, talking to the Boston Globe, right? Um, molten metal went public in February 93, ultimately raising more than $350 million and employing 500 people. They built a plant down in Fall River, Massachusetts, because the state has things for new companies that are going to guarantee new jobs. And Fall River was a depressed area, so they put it in Fall River. They were in commercial production by 1996, remember, 1996. And they were cleaning up the, the country's nuclear waste. I remember I heard about this when I was teaching over at Sloan, and they said, what do you, is some article in the Wall Street Journal about molten metal was going to start processing nuclear waste. And the students said, students asked me about it in class. I said, excuse me? They think they're going to get rid of radioactivity in a molten steel bath? All you're going to do is dilute it, right? And that makes things worse, in my opinion. Okay, that's what I told the students. I didn't know that they were actually going to take low-level radioactive waste, like old towels that had you know, radioactive contaminants on the paper towels, and they were going to put those into the uh, molten steel and burn them up. And somehow, someone was going to use that molten steel that was radioactive now. Well, I don't know that many people who are looking for radioactive steel as a marketable product. But nonetheless, okay, that's what they told people they were going to do. And it turns out, you'll see here, what helped Molten Metal get started was a cozy relationship with Vice President Gore. Executives gave tens of thousands of dollars in campaign, campaign contributions to Gore. And their big play was Harvard football legend Vic Gatto. Um, he was a Molten Metal executive. Now, he didn't know anything about Molten Metal, but he was a famous Harvard football player. And so obviously he was qualified, right? Um, and uh, he had tied the Yale-Harvard football game in 1968, uh, and it was a classmate of Gore's. And somehow they were able to secure $33 million from the Department of Energy to clean up nuclear waste by this technology. I still can't believe it today. They actually have scientists down there at the Department of Energy, and I can't believe that there weren't 50 people saying, Hey, hey, wait a second. This is crap. But you know, nobody did. They got $33 million. Became the focus of the Senate investigation, Finance Committee investigation, of whether this was playing loose and goosey. Just like we deal with Congress today and the democratic process of the Democrats and the Republicans going after each other, right? <laughs> So there's nothing new here, folks. Molten Metal filed for Chapter 11 at the end of 97. They had just started commercial production a year and a half earlier, right? I mean, they didn't last too long before they went through their $350 million, right? Um, but in the meantime, what was MIT's involvement? Preston, who was head of the Technology Licensing Office and a substantial shareholder in Molten Metal, was supposed to organize a town meeting to be held in Kresge Auditorium that Vice President Gore, who was a candidate for running, you know, for the presidency, was going to come to MIT to talk about technology and how it was going to save the world, right? Just like buzzword bingo, right? Um, Molten Metal was one of four companies invited to present. And here's a tech article that I dug out. Gore will speak here tomorrow on October 27th, 95, okay? Now, about this time, it turns out that Professor Sadaway and I thought there might be some problems here. It turns out many MIT faculty and administrators, the president of MIT, own stock in molten metal. Okay? No conflicts here, folks. No conflicts. Okay? 
Professor Sadaway and Eager complained. I complained, Sadaway complained to the Technology Licensing Office, and the number two person, I won't tell you her name, she became, she replaced Pre Preston when he got so rich he had to go on and count his money. And he was told that Preston's a good guy. Nothing wrong with what they were doing, okay? I told the vice president of MIT that I thought it was a conflict for the person organizing it who owned 10% of the company uh, to be putting them in front of the world at MIT Kresge Auditorium with Vice President Gore. I was ignored, okay? I was a whistleblower. I'm the whistleblower. President Trump, I'm the whistleblower, okay? No one cared. Because half the people I was, we were talking to owned stock in molten metal. No conflicts, no conflicts. Okay, uh, I asked the question about what metallurgists would think this was a good process. Well, it turns out the former head of the materials department was on the molten metal technology board of directors, or scientific advisory board, or whatever. Okay. Um, in 1995, I was department head. And Chris Nagel, the inventor of this wonderful technology, had given some of his $350 million to a junior faculty member at MIT to do some research in slag behavior of these steel baths and what would be the, the best slag to use in the molten metal technology system. And Chris came to me and sat in my office and said, this professor should not publish this work because he's, we funded it and we think it's proprietary and he should not be allowed to publish it. And I said, what am I supposed to say? I didn't own any stock now, folks. So I said, I'll look into it. So I called the assistant professor, or actually he was probably an associate professor at that time. He was coming up for tenure in a year. And uh, I said, what's going on here? He says, oh, we're working in this part of the phase diagram. This paper is in this part of the phase diagram. They funded the work oh, way over here in this other end of the phase diagram. So this work that he's claiming is theirs isn't theirs. It's all intellectual property regimes, right? And I said, okay. So Chris Nagel came back to my office. I said, I checked with the professor and he says, you funded the work over here. I showed him the phase diagram. He's a chemical engineer. He should have understood it. I said, I don't, I'm not going to tell him not to publish it. He has to publish. He's got to get tenure, right? And Chris Nagel stomps out of my office and I believe he went upstairs to the old department head who was a member of his scientific advisory board, okay? Later, a year later, less than a year later, I, was, I sent out for the letters to promote this junior faculty member and the part, we thought it was a very good case. And all of a sudden the letters, I got a letter from Japan in September of 1996 and it was a terrible letter. And I read it, I thought, this, isn't, this didn't make any sense for all I knew about the people in Japan and what they thought. This, Japan was probably the world's technologically most advanced steel making country in the world. And they wrote this so-so letter for his promotion. I immediately walked over to our administrative officer. I said, Joe, this professor didn't write this letter. The guy upstairs did. I pointed upstairs to the former department head. Well, so time goes on, months go on, and he was denied tenure. I was undergoing chemotherapy treatment for cancer at the time. I was not at full capacity. But I, I remember February school vacation week, which would be this time of 1997. And I decided I had to go to the dean and complain about this. Because this, in my opinion, this senior faculty member, and I had other data I'd gathered over the previous four months, that this senior faculty member at MIT had polluted the case for several reasons. He, he had his own former student who he wanted to hire in that same technical area. And he had brought that to me and I looked at it and said, no, we're not looking for somebody. We got this other professor who's coming up for tenure, and we think he's done pretty well. Well, 
not after we got a couple of bad letters from Japan. So I went to the Dean of Engineering and said, look, we got a problem. I got a senior faculty member who has polluted the case. And he says, well, we got to find out when Professor Fuwa comes here. Professor Fuwa was Mr. Steelmaking in Japan. He was a professor at Tohoku University. He'd come here after World War II on some sort of Fulbright or something. And he had worked and learned steelmaking under John Chipman, if you know the Chipman room in our room. In our, okay. John Chipman was the world's greatest steel-making chemist. Okay? And Ch Fuwa was coming to, Jap to MIT in May. Well, the tenure decision was going to be made in April. A little late for this young professor. I tried to present his case, but with these letters in there, it was death. Okay? He didn't get tenure. He's a tenured full professor over at BU now. Okay. His case was polluted. Um, Fuwa came, sat in my office, and I was pleasant to him. And he says, Professor so and so, my predecessor, who was on the board of Molten Metal, he told us you didn't want Professor so and so to get tenure. I said, No, that's not true. And that was sort of the end of it. Except at my visiting committee. You know what visiting committees are? So every department about two years, every two years has a visiting committee. It has people from the MIT Corporation. It has people from other universities. It has captains of industry who come to, and they evaluate the department over a day and a half. And they report back to the MIT Corporation, how's this department doing? It's really when the department head gets his grade. Okay? Okay. So at this point, the professor at BU has gone to BU. He's doing fine over there. He's still doing fine over there. But he should have gotten tenure at MIT if this other, my predecessor department head, hadn't screwed him. Okay? That's why I was hoping Jonathan, who asked about, you know, what's it like to be at a university? Well, he can watch the video if he wants, okay? Uh, this is the type of backstabbing that occurs. It's not unique to MIT, okay? So what happens is, um, uh, oh, I guess we had other big names, like Michael Porter was one of the great gurus of Harvard Business School, okay? He started his own consulting firm, and like, it was kind of like a McKinsey or a Bain or Boston Consulting Group, but he had one. Um, and he was on the MMT board, and there was also a Harvard, Harvard Nobel laureate. Can't remember his name, but if you watch one of the YouTube things on Molten Metal, it, he's on there, okay? They had gotten some very big name people. The Vice President of the United States, the Secretary of the United Nations uh, Environmental Summit, the Secretary General, and these big people who were, you know, they'd, they had some big name people to say how wonderful this company was. Okay, um, but in fact, MIT continues to this day to have inappropriate relationships of all kinds. There probably aren't more than two dozen going on right now, okay? But they haven't risen to the level of Epstein, of, of to the notoriety of Epstein. They're going on all the time. And I could, tell, I could have told other stories, but I chose Molten Metal because I was... Someone involved in some of it, personally. So why did U.S. Steel give up the patent rights? I mean, they're, you know, they could have been, you know, they could have had this technology. Well, it's true, molten iron is a universal solvent, similar to water at room temperature, and if you have a bachelor's degree in, chemi in chemical engineering, whatever Chris Nagel had before he came to MIT, you'd think, oh, you can dissolve anything in molten iron. But it turns out molten iron, because it is a universal solvent, and at high temperatures, it has to be contained within a refractory. If you want to reline a, a steel melting furnace in industry, it probably is a $20 million job and takes about three months. So you're going to take a half billion dollar facility, production facility, you're going to shut it down for two months, do $30 million worth of relining to put the refractory in, and hopefully the refractory will last for a year and a half, two years before you have to do that again. 
So 10% of your time is in relining. You've got a half billion dollar facility. You can start running the numbers if you like, but it costs a lot of money to replace the refractory. And there are ceramists all over the world trying to improve the refractory so they could last three years rather than a year and a half, okay? It's worth a lot of money. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to the steel company to get longer life out of those refractories. Unfortunately, two elements that destroy the refractory are sodium and chlorine. So all this toxic waste would be fine to put into the furnace as long as it didn't have any sodium and chlorine. Now, how many garbage dumps do you know that don't have any sodium and chlorine? Zero. But every metallurgist in the world, including Sadoway and Eager, knew that you can't be dumping sulfur, sulfur uh, sodium and chlorine into this furnace because it will just cause the refractory to melt away. Sodium and chlorine lower the melting point of the refractory and it actually melts. And it will last for months rather than years. Okay? Minor problem. They didn't ever bother telling anybody that. That's why Cider A and E thought this was a lousy thing to invest in. Um, but no one wanted to listen to us. Um, steel also contains carbon. Uh, duh, it's an iron carbon alloy. And in the presence of chlorine, you form this compound COCl2. That's known as phosgene. What was phosgene used for? It was one of the toxic chemical warfare gases of World War I. So that's one of these things that's coming out the top of this stack. It's phosgene. And Sadaway tells me that he was actually involved in uh, some litigation that occurred afterwards. He was a consultant in some of the litigation processes where some of these people at Molten Metal were indicted and stuff. And you also had dioxins and furans that were, which are fairly toxic themselves, that were produced in the bath from putting plastics in there. So you had to separate out all, you'd have to separate out all those types of plastics. I don't even know which plastics they were, but because I'm not a plastics person, but most people could probably figure out what those are. Um, and some, to me, the one, one of the things I used to say, small amounts of business and antimony, and I mean like 100 parts per million, will make the steel so brittle it can never be used for any structural application. You can't, once you get bismuth and antimony into the steel, there is no known way to get it out. So you got to make sure that if people use bismuth solders and stuff, you got to make sure that doesn't get into your waste stream. Okay? And this is just a few things. I mean, we didn't spend a lot of time. This is just stuff we knew off the top of our head. Um, that if you actually knew a little bit about the chemistry of what's going on here, and did, did anyone, I mean, you're a nuclear engineer, right? Did you think this is a solution to radioactive waste? No. You're just mixing it into a larger volume, okay? Maybe it's denser, but, you know. Okay, so the selling of the MIT name. We're, I'm done with molten metal for a while until the next slide. I used to say when I came here as an assistant professor that MIT gave me three things. A desk, a local telephone. Before the internet, I had to pay for my local telephones. I mean, my long distance calls. Now I don't, okay, because of the internet. They use voice over the internet protocol. But I had to pay for my long distance phone calls. I got a local telephone, they would pay for that. And except I would see them trying to slip it onto my research accounts from time to time, and I'd have to say, no, no, you're supposed to be paying that, not me. And they would give me the MIT name. I had the MIT imprimatur. I was a part of MIT. The only one of these things that had any real value was the MIT name, and I used to say, our job is to leave MIT with a better name than we found it, okay? That's still our job, all of you, because you have you will have the MIT name if, you know, with a brass rat to go with it, right? And people will see that. And so the venture capitalists, this was a point I made last semester. The venture capitalists are hanging around MIT to exploit the MIT name and have been doing so for years. I should have put decades. 
Is that different than what Epstein and the MIT faculty administration did more recently? You can think about it. Okay, the rest of the story about molten metal. Oops, did I not? Okay, there we go. The rest of the story. When MIT went bankrupt in 97, I breathed a sigh of relief as I read the Boston Globe article. MIT was not named in the article about the bankruptcy on the business, full front part, you know, most of the big headline on the business section of the Globe was Molten Metal Goes Bankrupt. Nagel and Haney were sued by a reinsurance company that had invested $20 million. A reinsurance company, just a big insurance company that had invested some of their money into Molten Metal. And they ended up saying, look, you guys were frauds, okay? And they were, okay? I don't know what happened to that. Preston, in the meantime, uh, went on after Molten Metal went defunct, he took the same Fall River plant and he got control of that and he went off to some widow in Switzerland or whatever who he convinced to invest $77 million in this new company, which was Molten Metal all over again. And eventually uh, he was convicted of fraud and embezzlement of her money. Hey, this is the legacy. You're going to be part of it. How about that? I don't think you're going to get these stories from most of the other people at MIT. Okay. But it's true. I gave the references. You can go read the articles. Okay. It happens all the time. And we should be ashamed of it. But we're not. Most, many people around here are trying to figure out how can they get part of the next one. And why are the venture capitalists doing this? Anybody know why? They don't care if the technology is any good or not. They want to tell the world, I found this, we found this technology at MIT, and if you invest in it, or when we have an IPO and you buy stock in this, you're going to be in on the next Google, or the next face, Facebook, or whatever. And you're going to be worth billions of dollars, just like these people. Except, who's going to be the first to cash out on the IPO? The venture capitalists. And what are they going to do? They're going to tell you this is the greatest technology in the world. It's all a marketing ploy. Unfortunately, the people who have good ideas at MIT are in that same soup when they're trying to get money for their startups. And they have to pay for the sins of all these people who are stealing from your grandmother's pension. Okay? Because that's what they're doing. As you can tell, I have some strong opinions about this. But I'm not telling you all of them. Um, okay, there's some handouts here. One's the, which has been on the... Uh, the website since the first day. It's an MIT faculty newsletter called Leadership Management and Education at MIT. This is an article that I wrote back in 2003 uh, because I didn't want the guy who was dean of engineering that wouldn't listen to the, the story about the young professor who was screwed. Uh, he became provost, okay? And he wanted to be president of MIT. I wrote this article, and his name is in here, Bob Brown. Okay, and there's a quote from him, okay, about, and I wrote this article in part so it would help expose who Bob Brown was and what his attitudes were. But I really wrote it on what it's like to be an MIT student. I was an MIT student for six years. I've been teaching MIT students for years, and I wrote this article, and some of my classmates thought this was the best article they had ever read. read. In fact, one faculty member from the humanities said he had quit reading the faculty newsletter, but after he saw this article, he decided he was going to start reading it again. So people liked the article. I thought, I spent a lot of time on that article. Now another article, which I wrote for the faculty newsletter, was MIT has the, uh, has a, a little pamphlet they hand out in the lobby of Building 5 to people who come to visit MIT. And I, I looked at that. I used to hand out some of these things, and I was reading one about 
how long ago? Oh, this is 2015. So I wrote this article because in there it said, research is the soul of MIT. How many of you people think that research is the soul of MIT? I think it's education is the soul of MIT. But when MIT is passing this out to all the visitors who come to the lobby of Building 5 to take a tour, they're told that research is the soul of MIT. So I, being the naysayer that I am, I wrote this article saying, I don't think so. Okay. And then another time, and this was in, when was this? Doesn't have the year on it. I wrote several articles. Pardon me? Actually, it doesn't look like my secretary copied both of the frog and water articles. I wrote an article called A Frog and Water, the Forces That Move Us. Um, and I'll have to make sure she posts the other version of this. They published it in two parts. But um, you know the story of a frog in water? You take a frog and you put him in cold, put him in hot water and he'll jump out. You put him in cold water and bring the water up in temperature, he never notices the change and he dies. Okay? So that's sort of a, a metaphor for being a faculty member. One of the students asked me to talk about being a faculty member. So this is the manage, management, leadership management and education at MIT is an article I kind of wrote based on the experience of being a student at MIT. This is sort of my idea of what the experience is of being a faculty member at MIT. I hadn't read it for a while. Chris Hsu came to visit me uh, a few weeks ago to thank me for helping, you know, being, not being a thorn in his side, I guess, when, I was when he was department head. And um, he mentioned something about it. So when I was going through some of these things, um, he, uh, you know, here's part two right here. She didn't copy, she didn't make a bunch of copies. Um, and it doesn't look like, oh yeah, she did. Um, he mentioned the frog and water article and I went back and read it last week as I was preparing these handouts and I thought, hmm, I like that better than the other one about what it's really like to be a faculty member uh, and how the world just sort of, the, the water gets hotter and hotter and you just don't notice the change. In fact, I think one of them I call, the first one is called The Forces That Move Us and this part two is The Long-Term Consequences of an Imperceptible Change, okay? So we get study, we have problems with that. And then I have a la last one, the handout, that some students asked me some questions back in, must have been 2014. And I'd, I was at the time writing a book about my experiences at MIT. And I've written about 70 or 80 pages, but I've only gotten up through junior year. Okay. Um, and you know, who knows if I'll ever finish it. But I wrote this, I wrote the, the prologue uh, before I finished writing the whole book. And I call it Surviving at MIT Lessons Learned. Now, this was 10 things. I'm up to about 20 or 24 now. But there's some, uh, some lessons I learned at MIT. You've got to learn to be humble, but don't be humiliated. And I tell you the difference between that, about working hard. Don't, don't procrastinate. Have self-confidence. Anyway, there are several things. You can read them. Some students liked it enough that one of them told me they had it mounted uh, next to their desk so they could look at it all the time. Well, I don't look at it all the time, but because uh, I went through it. Okay. Anybody have any questions? If not, I'll give you. You don't have any questions? This didn't raise any questions in your mind? Hopefully it did, whether you want to expose. But so um, I actually had to give a talk yesterday at church. And um, so I talked about this, which is the most appropriate award I've ever received. Okay? This is a piece of Steuben glass. 
Stuyven was started in 1903. It was sold in World War II, World War I to Corning Glassworks. It's in Stuyven County, New York. That's why it's called Stuyven Glass. And it's a, this is leaded glass. It's uh, very heavy. Um, and it's, these are expensive pieces of art, okay? And I turned it this way because so you won't see exactly what it is. And I, I, my talk, I said, I'm going to do show and tell. And so this is what I showed. And then I told them the story that in 1993, I was asked to serve on the board of directors of a company called Nashua Corporation up in Nashua, New Hampshire. Been there since 1845. Uh, started out making coded playing cards, okay, that all the people in the Western movies would be playing poker with Nashua playing cards, okay. And Nashua was now sort of a struggling half billion dollar a year sales company. And I was put on the board by the outgoing CEO who had saved the company from bankruptcy in like 1983. He is now at retirement age. He needed to put someone on the board and he put me on the board. We won't we talk about why later because I was a little surprised. And I knew Mitt Romney and I, I uh, had his kids and Cub Scouts and stuff. And I said, Mitt, I've never been on a board. What do you, what do, you do? He says, it's easy. Just go to the meetings and cash the checks. Well, not exactly, not this board. Turns out we got a new CEO. The very first meeting I went to, we also got a new CEO. We had the old CEO, but the new CEO was a guy from California, never worked for the company. He was taking over as the head of this company. And I kind of watched on the board. I went to the meetings, cashed the checks. Uh, but that first year, he took a half billion dollar company. And in one year, he was able to turn it into a quarter billion dollar company. He lost half of the sales in one year. And half the employees got laid off. Okay? I didn't think this was very good. It wasn't good for the stockholders, and that's who I was supposed to be reporting to. That's why the board members are supposed to be doing. And we had guys who were the CEO of EG and G. We had guy who was the CEO of Unimutual Insurance. I mean these and he he come in with his limo and his driver and so he could work while you know he got ferried around New England and stuff. We had all kinds of people, but we only had two academics. And so the new CEO, after about a year, he wanted to buy another company in Europe for $25 million. And we went around and everyone had all 13 board members or all 12 other board members other than the CEO had a reason why you shouldn't do this. And he said, well, I'd still like to take a vote. So we went around and every person voted. You know how they voted? I was the last one. Everyone voted yes to buy this company, even though all of them had stated in different reasons, 12 different reasons why this was a bad idea. When the CEO wanted to do it, they all decided to say yes. Except me, got to me. I said, I don't understand. I said that, I don't understand. I'm gonna abstain. I was shunned. We then went to lunch. I was shunned. No one would talk to me. Two days later, one of the, the other academic who was a business school professor from Dartmouth, he, said, he wrote to me and said, I wish I had the courage to do what you did. I thought, what? All I did was abstain on a vote that I didn't think was right. Well, it turns out over the rest of the year, I basically kind of, I went after this CEO and I started challenging him on all kinds of things. And he left, and we got a new CEO. And he hired uh, Corn Ferry International, which is a big consulting firm, to come in and reconstitute the board. We were all asked to resign, all 13 of us. And they were going to redo the board. And so at a final dinner, the new CEO gave out some awards to the people who were leaving. I wasn't asked to rejoin the board. Oh, gee, surprise. And this was my award. This is a Stuyven glass. And if I turn it around, you can look at it if you need to come up closer. It's a mountain lion ready to pounce. That was the message. I was the mountain lion on the board ready to pounce. And these other guys, I could tell you of other votes where they all said, this is the wrong thing to do. And then when the votes came in, they all voted yes. It's a wonderful system, isn't it? 
And I was pleased to be off that board. Okay? And you know what the new CEO did for me? He gave me a consulting contract, a retainer, that was exactly the same as if I had been attending the board meetings. I got paid the same and I didn't even have to go to the board meetings. He was, he had his little tongue-in-cheek award, which I think is funny, and he also compensated me for saving the company from bankruptcy. I'm telling you the story because you are going to have, you're going to rise to certain levels in whatever firms you're in, and you're going to see people posturing in committees, meetings. And you have to decide whether you're going to be the lightning rod that says, hey, there's something wrong here. And I'll tell you that 75% of the time, no one's going to listen to you. Just like when I said, there's something wrong, there's a conflict here. Preston shouldn't be putting molten metal on the stand in Kresge. I was ignored, okay? Just like when I went to the dean and said, this young faculty member's been screwed, I was ignored. And I, I had the facts. Professor Fua said, Professor so-and-so said you didn't want him to get tenure. That was a lie. But he didn't get tenure, so I lost that battle. You're gonna, you have to decide, are you going to go along with the crowd or are you going to fight and lose your job? I didn't lose my job, I have tenure. So, anyway. Okay, I know this hasn't, doesn't have a whole lot to do with structural materials, but I've actually been told by some students in prior years when I told some of these stories that they actually got some important things out of them. And hopefully you will as well. It's not a pretty world a lot of times out there, particularly when money gets involved.